Let's start by considering a clock. A very ordinary analog clock with its dial and hands to indicate the hours and the minutes. From a very early age, we've all been used to reading this kind of dial, so we are all able to understand almost instantaneously what the respective positions of the two hands mean. We all know, as well, that the hands of the clock do not revolve around the dial at the same speed. Yet we know that they will coincide one on top of the other at specific times during the day. At noon or at midnight, when the two hands come together on the 12 of the dial. Now, let's ask ourselves the following mathematical question. Since the dial is divided into 12 sections to indicate the hours, how many times in the course of 12 hours will this conjunction of the two hands take place? I'll give you five seconds to think. Well, unless you've been making or selling watches all your life, there is a fair chance you will answer this question by saying 12, and you will be wrong. The correct answer is, of course, 11. Indeed, over the course of 12 hours, the minute hand will have completed 12 revolutions around the dial. But we should be aware that the hour hand will also have moved forward and that in the meantime it will have managed to complete one revolution. And what matters here is precisely the difference between the respective numbers of revolutions. 12 minus 1 is 11. Why am I telling you all this? Because the Annus Platonicus, or the Great Year Doctrine, to which this unit is devoted, is an astronomical and mathematical problem that needs to be understood and interpreted essentially in the same way as all clock problem. Like every other people in antiquity, the Greeks did not conceive of time as linear, but as cyclical. Similarly, they also viewed the universe around them as geocentric, which means that they put the Earth at the center of their system. In this system, the Earth was surrounded by seven spheres, one for each of the planets they knew, including the Sun. These seven spheres were themselves circumscribed by an ultimate sphere, which was the sphere of the fixed stars. As in all other cultures, the most important cycles for everyday life were determined by specific periods of revolution, such as the day of 24 hours, the month or the year. In his Timaeus, Plato defines time as a moving likeness or image of eternity. And he calls the planets, or more appropriately, the planetary spheres, the instruments of time. It is also in the same text that we find the first genuine and undisputable discussion of the Great Year Doctrine. This discussion was to become the standard reference for world cycle, theory, world cycle theories until well into the European Renaissance. Thus, after having recalled that a month is measured by the return of the moon and a year by that of the sun, Plato explains, I quote, Nonetheless, it is possible to grant that the perfect number of time fulfills the perfect year at the moment when the relative speeds of all the eight revolutions have accomplished their courses together and reached their consummation, as measured by the circle of the same and uniformly moving." End of quote. In other words, Plato invites his reader to consider that the greatest cycle of the universe, which he himself calls the perfect year rather than the great year, is marked by the return into conjunction of all the seven planetary spheres with a starry sphere. Plato does not assign any value to this cycle, and nowhere does the philosopher provide an explicit method to calculate it. The rest of the passage nevertheless suggests that this computation is possible, at least to some people. 
The problem is, as we can see, very similar to our clock problem. Except that in this case, we would have to consider a clock with eight hands and each one presumably with a different speed of revolution. I shall come back to this in the next video.